Hello, everyone. Good evening. So my name is uh, Justine Sergi, and I'll be moderating the event tonight, uh, the webinar. So our lecture tonight is scleral lenses, basic to advanced troubleshooting. Dr. Pam Sachawacha Rapong received her optometry degree at the University of California, Berkeley School of Optometry, and she completed a residency program in cornea and contact lenses at the Southern California College of Optometry. She's the current vice president of the Sclera Lens Education Society, a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. Her interests are in specialty contact lens fitting for regular corneas, challenging refractive errors, disfigured eyes, and the treatment of ocular surface disease. She is currently an assistant professor, uh, clinical, clinical professor at the UC Berkeley and the chief mentor for the cornea and contact lens residency program. She teaches third and fourth year opt optometric interns in primary care and advanced contact lens clinic and is a guest lecturer for the second year contact lens course. She also treats patients in the ocular surface imaging clinic focused primarily on managing meibomian gland dysfunction. When she's not in clinic, she loves traveling to far off destinations and enjoying food and wine. Uh, Dr. Dan Fuller uh, received his bachelor's of science degree in 1980 from Purdue University and Doctorate of Optometry from 1984 from the Ohio State University College of Optometry. He began his career in a hospital-based setting in the U.S. Navy, serving for eight years. He spent 17 years in private practice as an owner of a multi-site solo practice emphasizing medical eye care, medical eye, and specialty contact lens services. His career in academia began in 1987. He holds the rank of professor, is the chief cornea and contact is the chief of the cornea and contact lens service and founding supervisor of the cornea contact lens uh, refractive surgery residency at the eye center southern college of optometry mm -hmm. he lectures nationally has authored numerous peer-reviewed papers posters and performs original clinical research he is a fellow of the american academy of optometry and the scleral lens education society he has held multiple chairs of leadership serving local state and national organizations you guys are all in a treat in for a treat tonight. We have a great, great group. So again, any questions, just put them in that question box and we'll be sure to address them at the end of the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Um, as you can see, we do have a few disclosures. Um, Justine already addressed a few of them during the introductions. So um, today we're going to be reviewing basic to advanced scleral uh, troubleshooting. I know that probably some of you, you are already familiar with how to work with basic scleral lenses, but we definitely wanted to do an overview of that. We wanted to review techniques on how to evaluate a scleral lens, learn specific observations to watch for, and common fitting problems, explain the nature of um, the most frequent adverse events encountered during scleral lens wear, we also want to provide a fairly rational approach to troubleshoot some of these issues in order to improve the patient's outcome. Uh, if we have uh, more time, we're also going to review scleral lens care and handling issues that most often result in visual com or comfort reduction. And then a brief review of technology that's now available to assist in fitting and troubleshooting. So let's get right into it. Um, I teach students and as is Dan, and we, we often get the question of, you know, what's the best way to evaluate a scleral lens behind the slit lamp? And while a lot of them, you know, assume that they might need an anterior segment OCT or some other fancy equipment to evaluate their scleral lenses, we assure them that that's not typically the case. Um, so let's go over how I would evaluate a scleral lens in office just using my slit lamp setup. So in terms of my first step, I'm always looking for corneal clearance. We know that sclerals are intended to vault the cornea completely. And there are a couple of ways you can do it. Um, one of the methods you can use is a cobalt blue light that's sort of a diffuse beam with 10 to 16 next magnification is usually pretty good. And what this will do is it will fluoresce areas that are clearing and help you localize either areas of touch or thinner areas of clearance. 
So if you look at the top photo on the slide, you can see that there's a nice robust amount of fluorescein under that scleral. But on the second slide, you can see there's an area of darkening where it may actually be thin or even touching. So while this technique can actually help you localize areas of touch or thinning, it won't tell you how much clearance there is. So I always tell my students I want to try and quantify if possible. So the second method that I'll use is a optic section. So here I typically switch to a white light beam with very um, bright um, illumination. And the optic section should be very sharp and in focus. I prefer a 16x magnification and no more than a 45 degree angle to my tower. And the reason that is, is we have uh, seen in studies that we have a tendency to overestimate central clearance if we, we have a more um, large angle for our tower. And while even at 45 degrees, we actually have been shown to still overestimate compared to, let's say, what an anterior segment OCT has, it's still um, going to minimize the amount while still allowing us to see all three layers. So if you look at the photo, photo on the far right, you can see that I've kind of highlighted the layers there. The yellow arrow is the th thickness of the contact lens. The green arrow is the fluorescein filled tear layer. And then the red is referring to the cornea. So for me, I always tell my students, make sure you measure the central thickness of the lens because that'll allow us to measure a ratio between the tear layer and that center thickness and give us an approximation in microns of clearance. I also tell them, please don't sit there, you know, counting microns. It is an estimation, and we already know it's not 100% accurate, but at least then we can be a little bit more consistent with our evaluations when that patient comes back for follow-up. So in terms of modifying how much central clearance or how much apical clearance there is, scleral fitters really have to understand sagittal depth, and we also have to understand that it's not just the base curve that controls the amount of depth that we have. So I always tell my students, you know, you have a corneal GP where you're really used to going um, off of the base curve and matching the corneal um, curvature, and you can fairly well predict what the fit might look like. But because scleral lenses land on the sclera, we can't always just try to fit based off of steep K value. So in this photo, I have two lenses, and they clearly have different sagitta. And you can look and see that they actually have the same base curve. But because they're a different diameter, the um, sag is quite a bit higher on the image on the left than it is on the right, despite them having the same base curvature. So I guess this is just to point out that there are multiple ways to affect the sagittal depth, the base curve being one of them, but you can also adjust the corneal uh, chamber diameter or the overall diameter of the lens. You can adjust some of the um, curves beyond the base curve, which could result in an oblate or reverse geometry design. And this can all affect the sagittal depth and affect the way that the lens fits on the eye. So the next step beyond looking at central corneal clearance is looking at limbal clearance. Uh, we're particularly interested in protecting the limbus where our you know, limbal stem cells are that are so important for keeping the cornea clear. So again, one way that you can view this is again with the cobalt blue uh, fil uh, lighting. I sometimes tell my uh, students to use a rattan filter because it um, might allow for a little bit better viewing of the fluorescein, but you can also use white light like the bottom left photo. In terms of the magnification, you can use a 10 or 16x magnification. So I'm highlighting the halo of the fluorescein. Here is an example where there's an absence of fluorescein and limbal touch. And here it is um, with white light. So another way that I'll evaluate limbal clearance is, again, with an optic section. You can use white light, and you can scroll down to the edge of the cornea to see whether or not there's an absence of fluorescein, as in this first photo here. You can see above it there is fluorescein present, and then it tapers out where it is now touching the cornea. On this other photo, you can see that there is a small thin wedge of uh, tear layer 
beyond the edge of the limbus, so we do have limbal clearance there. So ideally, we're looking for limbal clearance all the way around, and um, we want to make sure that it's not too excessive, but also not touching. So a couple ways that we can modify limbal clearance. We can increase the diameter if the lens initially chosen is too small for that patient's um, overall corneal size, then that might be the reason there is limbal touch. So increasing the overall diameter, uh, particularly in the corneal section, is uh, an appropriate change that you can make. If you feel that the curve is actually too flat, it's not that the um, lens is not big enough for that patient's eye, then you can steepen that limbal curve in order to improve the clearance there. As you might recall, both of these changes are also ways that increase the sagittal depth. So if you were happy with the amount of clearance you had in the center of your lens, you may want to compensate by reducing the sag to go back to the amount that you were happy with. So moving on to scleral alignment, um, we typically want to look for a nice, soft, even landing of the haptic or scleral portion of our lenses. I like to use white light that's diffuse. And in a lower magnification at about 10, I feel that this allows me to evaluate the lens and get a more global view um, more quickly. And what we're looking for essentially are areas of blanching, areas of edge lift, things that might present a problem for the patient long term. So these two photos on the right are showing you areas where the blood vasculature is getting cut off. The top photo being a more significant amount of blanching versus the bottom where it's a more subtle amount of fine vessel blanching. But the photo on the bottom left is showing nice, soft, even alignment. And you can see that those blood vessels are not being cut off by the edge of the lens. So again, we, we want the lens to land tangentially softly and distribute weight and pressure pretty evenly. Um, so I, I put this photo up of the OCT to kind of just give an idea of what I mean by landing tangentially. It should be kind of at a similar angle to the patient's sclera, unlike the bottom photo where you can see it's actually too steep of an angle and digging into the conjunctiva overlying the sclera. So this is an instance where if we were to look at that clinically behind the slit lamp, it would most likely show a blanching appearance. Um, and again, I know not everybody has an OCT, so you certainly can do this clinically with a slit lamp, but the OCT can be beneficial in maybe troubleshooting an area where you're not necessarily seeing something behind the slit lamp, but the patient is complaining. So here's two examples of types of blanching. Um, the nomenclature that we've used in the past is um, terms like impingement. So impingement is a type of blanching where there's excessive bearing on the very outer edge of the lens or the outer curve. So that's this first photo here. Um, in these cases, usually the landing is too steep, and it's pretty intuitive to change it and troubleshoot this problem. You just need to flatten the peripheral curve to lift it up away from the uh, conjunctiva. I will say that um, sometimes this is also termed as towing because the very edge is going uh, into the conjunctiva, so you may hear that term thrown about when discussing scleral lenses. The second one is compression. And here's where we actually have excessive bearing on the inner landing zone. So there's actually pressure closer to the limbus, which is why you have that really um, red area of paralimbal hyperemia. But then adjacent to that, you have the area where it's bearing and it's white. But then you can see further out towards the very edge of the lens, there's actually not a white area. In fact, the blood vessels seem to be flowing past there pretty normally. So in this case, that inner curve is actually landing too flat. Um, so the, the difference between the um, two curves from the limbus to the first scleral curve are too different, and it causes somewhat of a hinge effect. And that place where those two curves meet is causing the blanching. So the solution to this is essentially to reduce the hinge by modifying one or both of those curves. So on the flip side, in addition to blanching or um, impingement or compression, as we might call them, you can also have excessive edge lift. And I think this is also fairly intuitive. 
usually excessive edge lift is something that the patient will complain about because they'll feel the edge particularly as they blink or the lens may be moving on the eye and so i think this is fairly easy to flush out especially because of patient complaints it could also reduce vision as you can see in this first photo there are some bubbles creeping in into the edge of this lens and this particular patient of mine over time as they blinked the bubbles got pushed in and actually coalesced to um, obstruct the center part uh, above their pupil so they actually complained of vision not as well as um, some ledge, lens edge awareness. So in this case, what you can do is you can steepen the peripheral curve to reduce that edge lift, and that typically solves the problem. So um, moving away from the fitting per se of the lens, sometimes when you're checking the vision for the patient, you may find that they are not achieving the acuity you expect with just a spherical over refraction and you might find that they're achieving better acuity with astigmatism correction. So there are a couple of reasons why we might have residual astigmatism um, occur, one being lens flexure. So because these lenses are relatively large, they often are covered by the upper and lower lids. And occasionally for some of my patients, especially if they have very tight set lids, um, as they blink, they might actually cause the lens to bend. And in this case, if you are suspecting this to be the problem, you can take keratometry readings over the lens. And if they're not spherical, it's likely that the lens is bending. A um, Couple of ways to battle this. We can increase the center thickness of the lens to prevent it from being as pliable. Or you can, um, if you think it's the reason it's bending is because the lens is not well aligned with the sclera, sometimes using a toric peripheral system can better align the lens uh, with the sclera and resolve this problem. The second um, common cause of astigmatism is that some of it is lenticular. And we know that both the cornea and the lens can contribute to our overall refractive error. So in this case, um, unfortunately, changing the thickness or the periphery of the lens is not going to fix this problem. But you can, um, from many companies now, order a front surface toric and um, you can see here, I've just kind of highlighted this particular design. They have toric markings that are little drill dots on either side of the lens. Um, of course, this means that it will be rotationally dependent. So it'll behave much like a soft toric lens will that if it rotates, then it can affect the way that the patient sees. So ideally, what would happen is you'd have a patient, if you ordered a front surface toric, Hopefully those toric markings won't move and you can get a pretty stable vision. However, if it does rotate, then you can redo the um, spheral cylindrical overrefraction and have the lab reincorporate that in. Alternatively, of course, you can also design overlay glasses um, with that sill incorporated. And I particularly use this for my patients who are also presbyopic and need an ad. Uh, when we're troubleshooting these things, some of the biggest problems we run into are shape problems with the cornea. The cornea has got a normally prolate shape, and after surgery, they will have an oblate shape where it's uh, flatter in the center and steeper to the periphery instead of the reverse case, which is more normal. Uh, you can see examples there that penetrating keratoplasties or graft patients. Uh, we still have a lot of RK patients out there and patients that may have had intacts, and we're seeing a bit of a revival of that with the cross-linking that's come out now, and that can flatten the center by steepening the periphery as well. Uh, peripheral ectasias like pellucid uh, marginal degeneration um, has such a, a peripherally displaced ectasia that you're, you're having to work over that area uh, with large diameter lenses and uh, sometimes to reduce the vault because of that larger diameter, as was pointed out earlier, in that larger sagittal depth, uh, you need a reverse curve on there to bring that lens down. Um, similarly, uh, corneas that are scarred from uh, infections or trauma, including surgical trauma, oftentimes require uh, some unique uh, adjustments to the designs. Uh, this first case is a patient of mine that I had that uh, presented a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a 16-year-old African-American male. Uh, he presented with uh, keratoconus, 
And uh, before we could get the lenses dispensed to him, he went into an acute high drops. Um, and at that point then, uh, it took a period of uh, between four and six months to get the cornea quieted down and, and the edema resolved to the point that a penetrating keratoplasty can be considered. And you can see on the left-hand series of, of pictures uh, an OCT at the bottom that uh, I think you can probably appreciate how the uh, posterior portion of the cornea has cleaved off, including the uh, endothelium, allowing the cornea to swell up to much greater than normal thicknesses. And it takes a while for those uh, endothelial cells to slide back over and uh, start performing their pump function again. Um, I was able, uh, this actually is the right eyes, it's labeled left eye, but I mislabeled it, it's actually the right eyes you can see. Uh, after the graft, uh, you can see in that middle series of, of pictures, the scarring at the bottom, and I was able to put him into an oblate shaped lens design, and with that uh, combination of graft and scleral fit, he was able to get back to 2020 and was actually seeing a little bit better than the eye that did not have the, the uh, high drops, uh, which we fit with a normal prolate shape and got them to a little bit worse than 2020. Um, so case two here is a patient that I saw during my residency. He actually came to me with the appearance of the lens on the left-hand picture. And he was asymptomatic. He was actually quite happy with his lenses. But as you can see, there was a, a semicircular area of corneal touch at the inferior portion of his cornea. And when I removed the lens, I actually saw that um, there was a corresponding area of corneal staining. And though he was comfortable and his vision wasn't affected because this all was occurring below the visual axis, I wasn't really happy with leaving the lens this way for a long period of time. He was in a standard design. So I actually, um, refit him into a reverse geometry design in order to vault this peripheral area and ended up uh, being able to clear up that corneal staining and still maintain the patient's uh, vision and comfort. So this was another good indication for um, a pellucid marginal degeneration patient with very inferior um, ectasia. It's a great series of pictures, Pam. Um, other challenges that you have, again, as we mentioned uh, in the surgical realms, the, the cross-linking and intax combination uh, is, is, as I say, a little bit more common than it had been. Uh, this is a little bit more unusual. At 43, generally you think of aging having naturally cross-linked the cornea. We don't see progression as frequently in this age group, but it does happen. Uh, this patient, again, was able to be fit with uh, a scleral lens design with the parameters that you see there. Uh, and there's a little bit of scarring kind of paracentrally off to that uh, right-hand side of the image that you're seeing. Uh, this one, the, the scarring caused enough of a distortion centrally that uh, even with an over-refraction, we weren't able to get the vision improved uh, to 2040. Um, Pinhole ship, no additional improvement. Uh, so it goes to show you that, that even with these uh, marvelous uh, devices that we have available to us now, uh, the patient was certainly a lot better than what they were uh, prior to using a scleral lens, but sometimes we can't quite get them back to uh, 2020 vision. Uh, they still may have a lot of higher order aberrations induced from the scarring. Uh, additional issues that you have with alignment uh, stems from the fact that as you move out away from the cornea, uh, much beyond about that 15 millimeter cord length, the uh, sclera becomes much more rotationally asymmetric. Have a number of studies from our friends up at Pacific uh, uh, College of uh, Pacific University College of Optometry that have done quite a bit of work in this area. Uh, so that asymmetry of, of the anatomy as you move out closer to the insertion of the recti becomes an issue. Um, you can end up with uh, tight lens problems. You can have loose lens problems. Uh, uh, and we can have something called conjunctival prolapse, where the conjunctiva actually gets uh, drawn in underneath the uh, edge of the scleral lens and overlaps into the, the limbal areas. Uh, and you can have a number of uh, obstacles out there as you move further out away from the limbus. Pinguicula is probably the most common. A lot of these patients, uh, especially the post-surgical ones, may have uh, multiple problems, and they may end up with filtering blebs. They may have... Um, 
shunts out there. Uh, they may have cysts out on the conjunctiva, a variety of different things. And uh, all of these can pose uh, problems for you uh, geographically as, as you move away from the limbal area. So um, as Dan mentioned, a lot of the times with the larger lens, an asymmetric or toric scleral anatomy is going to present more of a problem if you use a spherical peripheral system on your scleral lenses. So this can make the alignment challenging. So sometimes we may order what we call a quadrant specific or toric peripheral curve where we are modifying one meridian or one quadrant to better align with our patient's sclera. So here we have an example where in the uh, horizontal meridian, this patient had a um, areas of blanching. However, in the vertical meridian, they had too much edge lift, and you can see the bubbles were um, entering in in that location. So modifying one would make the other one worse if we were to do this 360 around the lens. So this patient required a toric periphery. Tight lens problems kind of stem from that same uh, comment that Pam had made earlier about this toe effect. Um, if you can imagine having a uh, very proud cornea, something where the ectasia is particularly steep, to get over that steep area, if you're using smaller diameter lenses in particular, uh, you may end up having to dive down so quickly that that edge of the, the lens and the scleral portion starts to dig into the bulbar conjunctiva. Um, the obvious problems you have with this can be things like hypoxia. You can have um, indentation rings on, on the mild end of the spectrum, and you can have uh, seal off with uh, more mechanical damage to the bulbar conjunctiva in that area. Um, it, the patients generally become uncomfortable over time. Their wear times are shortened. Uh, frequently, their vision will become reduced as they start to develop some swelling underneath uh, the reservoir. Um, the adjustments that you want to make to that, if, if you've tried to go with a smaller diameter lens so that you stayed on that rotationally symmetric part of the sclera, this may be an indication then that you have to move out further with a larger diameter lens to get over that, that very uh, um, proud uh, corneal uh, protrusion. Um, you can uh, adjust the limbal zone um, in a multiple ways. Most of the contemporary lens designs have anywhere from three to five curves in between the optic section and the edge. Uh, that gives you a lot of flexibility where you can manipulate one independently of the other. Uh, you may need to be able to adjust the landing zone alone out in the scleral portion to create that soft landing that uh, Pam described just a moment ago. Uh, loose lens problems kind of go the other way. Um, the complication with having a loose lens are that you can have that lens actually sag down. The pressure of the lid against the apex of the lens itself will help push it further down as the, the lid interacts with the lens. That'll push it down to the point where it rests on uh, that part of the mid peripheral cornea at the base of the cone. That'll cause some uh, staining problems, may cause edema. Uh, mechanical abrasions in those areas. Uh, it's usually an uncomfortable position for the patient. Uh, their wear time is going to be reduced as well. If you look at the uh, fluorescein image off to that right side, you can see that it creates sort of a wedge or a prismatic wedge uh, where it's um, narrower at the apex towards the top of the image, broadens out towards the base. Uh, and that's what you would typically see on an optic section um, as you try to look to see if the lens is sagging downwards. Um, the adjustment you would make to that is that you would decrease the diameter. Uh, you might have to steepen up the limbal zone to take up that potential space in there that's loosening things up. Uh, and you may have to make these adjustments in the landing zone that Pam described a moment ago by going to toric peripheral curves. If it more closely aligns the asymmetry of the sclera, the lens is less inclined to, to move like that vertically. Uh, conjunctival prolapse, as uh, mentioned a moment ago, uh, this oftentimes can accompany a loose lens. Uh, if you have an excessive amount of vault in, in the center, central portions of the lens, uh, 
of that conjunctiva, if it's fairly lax and loose, as in uh, conjunctival chalasis, you can pull that up over the limbal areas. Um, that, that conjunctiva is not meant to be there and adds an extra layer uh, and creates um, a barrier to the oxygen getting through to the limbal areas and, and can incite uh, neovascularization. Uh, the, this is, uh, scleral lenses in general are already a semi-sealed system without a lot of tear exchange as best we understand it and uh, clogging up that, that potential space can further reduce any kind of uh, tear exchange. Uh, given enough time, that conjunctival will actually start to adhere over those limbal stem cells and it'll go through a conjunctivalization process uh, as, as it uh, starts to scar in. Um, the adjustment you would make here is, since it's a problem basically associated with too much potential space in that region uh, or in the limbal zones, uh, reducing the sagittal depth centrally will help bring the entire lens down on some of these bitangential designs and so on. Or, or you can independently manipulate those curves if you're happy with the central sag uh, to reduce that space. Um, using uh, celluviscin in the bowl, uh, adding that in with uh, saline or, or just by itself creates uh, extra viscosity that can sometimes uh, uh, resist that, that um, conjunctiva from prolapsing underneath. And I've had some patients where I've struggled for uh, three, four lens orders trying to resolve it, trying all these tricks, and it hasn't worked. And it's a fairly simple process to send them out to have a conjunctival plasty done, and they can do that with electrocautery or other techniques. And um, it's a very simple in-office procedure, not too just uncomfortable for the patient. And within seven days, typically, they're ready to resume lens wear. So um, as you guys heard, there are many conjunctival obstacles that we can encounter with these patients, um, by far the most common being pinguecule. Um, so the top photo there is uh, obviously not a happy looking eye, although the patient themselves had no complaints. They were very happy with their vision. I was not happy with the way this lens came in. Uh, so their pinguecula was quite nodular and the lens is landing right in the middle of it. So you can see that underneath the lens, that pinguecula is white and flattened. And then beyond it, it's extremely hyperemic. So I would say that, you know, because of the shape of that lens, you could try, or excuse me, the shape of that pinguecula, you could try flattening that peripheral curve, but I would argue you would probably run into some other problems if you were just doing a flattening of the periphery because you might be able to vault up over that pinguecula a little bit, but then you might induce a problem in another region of the edge of the lens. So some of the other options we can do are notching is um, in which we actually have the lab um, cut out a small region of the peripheral system of the lens to avoid the obstacle that we're trying to um, get around. And typically, you just need to be uh, measuring the area that you want to be cut out, but you have to do this with caution. Um, you can't cut out so much that you actually go too far and break the semi-seal system that the sclerals have, because then you'll have another problem. So that's that first picture where we show notching on either side. We can also try for some um, manufacturers a sort of vaulting over the obstacle in which there's not actually an area of the plastic that's cut out, but it's actually lifted up in order to minimize the amount of pressure on that obstacle. So here's an example of one of my patients who has a pinguecula, and we used a vault system over that. Now, if um, these are not working or if you are able to access um, the iPrint Pro, which is actually a molded design, um, that obviously does a really great job of matching the patient's scleral topography quite nicely. And so um, this is a really advanced way to uh, avoid some of these obstacles at a very um, matched level to that patient. So other conjunctival obstacles that I've encountered, um, this patient had a very long-term large bulbar cyst. Um, I tried to actually decrease the diameter of the lens to land within the cyst, as this first picture shows. But unfortunately, this patient was still complaining that it wasn't very comfortable. And so then um, I had to end up notching it anyway. 
So another common troubleshooting problem that you may run into is lens decentration. And we alluded to this already a little bit, but the most common way a lens will decenter is down and out. Um, this is mostly because of the anatomy of the eye. The nasal sclera is the shortest and the flattest, which often wants to cause a scleral lens to decenter to the temporal side. Additionally, we have lid anatomy that can contribute. As Dan mentioned earlier, a tight upper lid or a very tight small palpable aperture can push a lens downward. And the size and depth of the lens contributes. We know this is a large lens, it has weight, as does the fluid layer underneath. And so it can also decenter just due to weight and center of gravity, especially if it's a very steep lens. So for lens drop, um, the most common complication might be corneal staining. And usually it's going to be in the superior nasal quadrant because of the nature of the way that the lens likes to decenter inferior temporally. And this one can also cause excessive vault inferiorly, similar to that prism effect or that wedge effect that Dan showed earlier. And um, the reason that we kind of want to avoid excessive vault over that limbus is that we don't want to have any um, excessive hypoxic event occur in that region of the cornea. So adjustments to um, the lens are essentially intended to reduce the sag and or the lens weight. So these are kind of similar to some of the things Dan described earlier for loose lens, but we can decrease the overall diameter. We can also um, flatten the base curve or the vault if it's excessive. And um, you can also decrease the center lens, uh, the lens center thickness if it is appropriate. The other, uh, probably one of the more common things that you see, and the numbers vary on this depending on who you read, but uh, quite a quite a high percentage, upwards of uh, 50 percent. Some claim 100 percent of the folks will have uh, clouding in the tear reservoir in that that post lens uh, space. Um, the consequences of this will vary depending on the cause and and how severe it is. But generally, the patient's going to come in complaining of reduced vision. They'll also generally have reduced wear time. Uh, if you look in that tear reservoir, you'll see some stagnant or inflammatory debris sometimes. Um, the key to fixing this is identifying the cause, but again, a lot of these problems are, are stem from having excessive space in there, so reducing the vault can help uh, uh, dissuade that from happening. You can um, make sure that you're aligned in all of the quadrants uh, using a uh, toric uh, scleral zone instead of a... a um, a symmetrical uh, scleral zone. You can uh, again add this cocktail in that I mentioned of something like Cellulisk with uh, um, the saline and again we want to use preservative free agents since it's held against the eye and the epithelium all day long. Um, sometimes uh, removing, they call it midday fogging, but it's also midday removal. You'll have uh, patients that will remove the lens halfway through the day, uh, clean it, rub and rinse it, and reinsert it with saline. Um, folks that have done this generally will have uh, uh, longer wearing times than those folks that don't when these problems arise. And, you know, Dan, I agree. I, I found that, you know, I now that I've been kind of minimizing the amount of vault, I haven't had this happen as much as it used to. Um, and I think that's because we've kind of adopted a sort of change in how much vault we find is appropriate over the course of the last, you know, five plus years. So um, I do think that reducing the excessive vault is probably one of the uh, best ways to manage this. So I agree with you. I, I completely agree with that, Pam. Uh, here's kind of a worst case scenario. This patient, um, is one that a colleague of mine, Dr. Edmondson, uh, had seen and asked me to take a picture of for him with my cell phone. Um, this individual was uh, actually still wearing the scleral lens, believe it or not, um, on this eye, and you can see it's pretty angry. Um, he decided to go extended wear uh, over a two-week period, and um, I call this my pseudo hypopion. What, what you're actually seeing is mucus and inflammatory debris built up in the reservoir between the posterior surface of the scleral lens and the cornea. Uh, so this goes to show you how, how uh, problematic some of this is when patients uh, don't behave themselves. And as uh, we've said a couple times now, these are semi-sealed systems without a lot of tear exchange. And um, 
this stuff doesn't go anywhere after a while it just kind of seals down uh, on the surface of the eye I had another patient that was fit by another colleague of mine at the college uh, two weeks ago that came in with an ulcer uh, they had run out of the non-preserved saline couldn't find it in the local stores and decided to wear the lens uh, extended wear rather than take it off because they were seeing so well and they ended up with uh, a microbial keratitis so you have to be very clear in your instructions to patients written instructions are uh, great reinforcement and every time you talk to any contact lens patient it's an opportunity to reinforce compliance and educate yeah absolutely and you know you, that's a very common case where where patients will just not know what to do if they run out of their saline. So educating them on where they can get that is is really important. And um, I I always get, send my patients home with uh, information about where they can purchase it, but also with the knowledge and telling them that hey, you really don't want to wait till you you know completely run out. Um, having some backup is always a good idea. Uh, this is the same patient's lens after removal, and and these things kind of come under the heading of that patient that comes in and says. Why it, it really wasn't that bad yet, and and they wait till they fall off the cliff completely before they they search for a, a solution to the problem they have, um, you know. And and you can see the film that builds up on these lenses, just like with your sci high soft lenses. The amount of silicone that goes into these things uh, tends to attract lipids more than it does uh, proteins like the uh, old uh, hydrogel materials did. Um, they add fluorine compounds to the fluorosilicone acrylates to uh, diminish that, and the fluorine acts also as uh, another uh, wetting agent and so on. It helps provide dimensional stability and a little bit better uh, oxygenation. But, um, you know, this patient sorely tested uh, the limits of, of what they were doing. Uh, plasma treatments um, can help uh, keep deposits away. Um, these... Um, uh, tend to break down very quickly with handling by the patient, so they're very short-lived. It's just a way to kind of hyper-clean the lens that the lab sends out. Um, Hydropeg from Tangible Sciences has been, uh, I think, a game-changer for us. Um, the polyethylene glycol part of that is a very common constituent agent of a lot of um, artificial tears and wetting agents. Um, this is uh, considered to be uh, more or less a permanent coating on the lens. Uh, that can be applied even now to soft lenses, they're, they're starting to apply it. Uh, there are some cautions on, on care and handling of these things uh, to keep them working. You don't want to use abrasive cleaners, tap water, um, uh, things like ProGent, which is an enzymatic type cleaner, or a chlorine-based cleaner, I mean, and uh, enzymatic cleaners can all break that coating down. Uh, but the whole idea here is, is to further reduce the wetting angle uh, so that it... Uh, Again, it keeps the it keeps the biofilms and deposits at bay. Um, just as you can have problems in the uh, reservoir, uh, and you can also have problems on the front surface of the lens. Uh, here's a, a patient building up a, a film on the front of the lens as well. Um, these folks um, oftentimes will do well with uh, the addition of. Uh, things like those progent chlorine based cleaner, um, the optimum extra strength cleaners, um, the uh, uh, substitute for the mirror flows that you can get now in, in uh, some of the big box stores. Uh, additional enzymatic cleaners can take the uh, protonaceous deposits off. And um, I, I tend to prefer peroxide based systems for most of my patients most of the time. Um, that way, if they're wearing other lenses too, it works just fine on hydrogels, sci highs, uh, other corneal GP designs where you may be mixing up lens designs between the two eyes. Um, that that seems to work well, and, and things like ClearCare Plus have additional uh, um, wetting agents on them. Other things you can do, uh, patients can't always take their lenses off to deal with these kind of problems midway through the day. They, um, uh, they may not have um, a supply of uh, solutions with them. You can take the plunger and, and kind of use the small plunger if it's available and kind of use it like a squeegee to clear, clean off the surface of your lens. Um, you do want to have uh, your plungers replaced and 
uh, on a regular basis and they need to work to keep those clean too at home. Um, the same uh, admonitions go for these things as go with any uh, contact lens where you want to avoid using hand lotions and, and things that leave films, uh, soaps and, and that sort of uh, material. Um, and you want to ensure uh, fundamentally that you're getting at the root cause of, of these problems. So looking for ocular surface disease problems related to particularly meibomian gland dysfunction uh, is an important part of that. Many of these patients we get referred to us uh, by the cornea people are being referred because they have these ocular surface disease problems. Uh, if they haven't been identified, then you have to identify them and institute uh, a concomitant treatment plan to go with those as well. So um, other corneal issues that we may run into, um, I've seen sort of a interesting appearance on the epithelium when a lens is removed. It almost looks like a waterlogged effect, like when something's been sitting in water for too long. And we've called this epithelial bogging. It's not true staining, so it's not like an epithelial defect. And there are some questions as to whether or not this is benign or not. Um, obviously, we know that there's still a lot of research that needs to be done on long-term use of scleral lenses, and this is potentially an area that we'll be looking into. Um, some other things is a patient can have a bubble-induced corneal impression. Uh, this is usually going to be quite obvious because it will be a very round, distinct, bordered lesion where the bubble was pressing, pressing into the cornea because it was trapped behind the uh, lens. So usually this is due to patient insertion error. So you can review application technique with them and make sure that your sclera is well aligned in all quadrants and that that bubble didn't creep in from somewhere else. I'd say by far, though, the most common one that I see on this list is toxic keratopathy from improper care of the lens. So the patient on the bottom there is one that I had sent away for his um, six-month follow-up. He was coming back saying that everything was okay. Um, he didn't notice any discomfort or any major vision changes, but when I removed the lens, it might be a little hard to see because the photo is small, but he had kind of a fine diffuse pancorneal staining and he had sort of more coalesced areas inferiorly and maybe a little bit centrally. And when I questioned him, it sounded like he was doing everything appropriately. Um, he actually preferred to use a multi-purpose solution for cleaning rather than um, the peroxide-based system that I usually recommend as well, just like Dan. Um, so what was happening is in, in the beginning, he was rinsing this out quite well with his saline before filling the bowl and putting the lens on. But he got a little lazy and ended up not really rinsing the bowl very well. So he was essentially diluting some of his cleaner with his saline and putting it on the eye, and it was stagnating there. So this is another reason why I, like Dan, also prefer to use the peroxide-based cleaner since they're um, preservative free. You kind of have less um, chance for this to occur, but realistically, um, just educating the patient uh, really fix the problem. And so it's just proper education and also reinforcing that education each time that they come in. Never assume that they're doing it exactly the way that you taught them. One of the uh, more controversial subjects in, in scleral lens fitting is this whole issue about oxygen transmissibility, that's your DK over T, uh, and, and um, the potential risk of corneal edema, both centrally and out in the limbal area, which is getting more attention these days um, uh, as we have uh, increased our understanding. Um, when you think about this, you have to think about uh, the T and the DK over T includes both the reservoir plus the center thickness of the lens. Uh, so you're expanding things quite a bit, uh, you know, over what you might have in any other lens design. So there's been a number of theoretical models developed. The challenge is, is that our clinical experience doesn't seem to square with what the models predict. In other words, we don't seem to see rampant hypoxia that might otherwise be predicted by the model. Um, and there are different things and techniques we can employ to avoid uh, the probability that this can develop as well. Um, so just kind of a refresher course, if it's been a while since you've thought about these things, um, the Holden-Mertz criteria 
uh, suggests that we need a DK over T of 24 in the central cornea to prevent hypoxia in daily wear. Uh, Harvard Banano uh, suggests that that number is 35 out of the limbal areas. Uh, Philip Morgan in uh, the Manchester University in the UK uh, suggests that centrally it should be 20 and peripherally 33, so these are fairly well aligned. And um, if we think about extended wear, and we're not, not doing that across uh, commonly with uh, scleral lenses, then um, the modified criteria is around 125 uh, fat units. Uh, some of our friends uh, down in uh, Houston have done a little bit of work trying to look at um, basic surrogate measures of hypoxia. Uh, when you have hypoxia, you know that we've looked for corneal edema to kind of indicate that it's there. Um, there's there's mounting evidence out there that uh, uh, scleral lens wearers uh, have in the range of two to three percent uh, hypoxia chronically. Um, if you think about the closed eye state, we maybe get around four uh, percent in overnight with the the uh, lid closed, but when we open our lids in the morning, very quickly within say a half hour or so, that swelling reverses itself. Well, here you're talking about patients that go from that to wearing a scleral lens, and they never quite completely de-swell. So we don't know right now what the long-term implications of that are for the patient, and it is something that is concerning that, that causes us to be a little bit careful. When you're a hammer, everything tends to look like a nail, and I often get asked, uh, is a scleral lens your first choice? And my answer is always no. Uh, it's unique to the patient, but I follow the KISS principle. I keep it simple first before I, I go to a scleral lens. Um, but there's really no long-term impact uh, studies on, on things like uh, the corneal endothelium. What we've done in our clinic is um, tried to look at their baseline uh, specular microscopy findings and then periodically, maybe once a year, check them again, uh, particularly in graft wearers. So uh, that leads into the next point that um, is it a concern for everybody? Uh, well, question mark, maybe. Uh, we know for sure that there are certain eyes that are at greater risk. Um, Post-penetrating uh, keratoplasty patients uh, tend to lose um, maybe as many as 45% of their endothelial cells um, in, in the first three years or so uh, based on an Australian graft registry study. and um, We've had uh, suggestions from uh, some outstanding people like Loretta Shotska Flynn up at the Case Western University that um, eyes with uh, cell counts at 1,000 cells per millimeter squared and, and lower are at particular risk. So for those eyes, um, you know, we'll use the highest DK materials we can get. Uh, you might ask, why don't we do that on everybody? Well, Pam's already mentioned lens flexure can be a problem, particularly with larger diameter lenses. Um, we try to limit the center thicknesses, um, and that may mean that we have to go smaller because a smaller lens is less likely to flex than a larger diameter lens, and we can generally get the center thickness down a little bit more as well. Um, and that, that assumes that you can actually still clear all the obstacles underneath the, the vault. Um, going with low clearance designs, and there's some of those out there even for normal corneas, uh, if we get under, uh, say, the threshold of 200 mic microns, uh, which has been suggested by our colleagues at uh, Waterloo, uh, uh, Longis Michaud, uh, that that may be kind of the, the sweet spot that we shoot for. Uh, the limbal clearances, um, uh, maybe 15 mi 50 microns or so to avoid uh, uh, hypoxia in the limbal stem cells, but uh, there's still a lot of debate and controversy about these things. Yeah, and you know, I, I completely agree with um, that. I, I think it is really important that we consider each patient as an individual. You know, mentioning normal corneas, I, I think that is a big debate right now. Should we be fitting normal corneas with scleral lenses? And I think that identifying the risk versus benefit for these patients is really important. And I think that the uh, philosophy of starting simple is always a good idea as well. Yeah, and I think that being said, you know, I, I certainly have patients that 
are even at 800 cell count. And many times uh, I've, I've, we draw a lot of patients in my resident and I from uh, three corneal specialists in the area. And, um, you know, they're oftentimes sending me the patient not to, to uh, prevent them from having a cornea graft. They know that's in their future many times. They're just trying to keep them out of the OR as long as they can. And so if you do that, scleral lenses have really been a game changer from the standpoint that just like any transplant, there's a shortage of donors. This really helps work on the demand side if we can keep them in scleral lenses and reduce that demand. Um, reducing wearing times and, and Clark Chang, a colleague of ours, uh, if, if they're a bilateral lens wearer, we'll sometimes get them a full work day by letting them wear it on one eye for four hours and then let it wear on the other eye for four hours with its scleral lens, not swapping lenses back and forth, but assuming they're bilateral wearers. Um, and I, I told them I would call that the, the Clark Chang holiday. <laughs> um, um, technological advancements, these have been amazing too. You can imagine uh, when I started out with Helmholtz in my class, uh, we were doing Placido's disc on cardboard uh, handles, um, and, and we've gone through uh, keratometers up to uh, uh, topography uh, and now into tomography. Well, the next generation thing is uh, scleral mapping technologies where we're able to get 3D maps. And what's happening as we do this is we're less dependent on reflections from the tear film. And if you've ever tried to do topography on a really steep cone, the peak gets wet, but the valleys stay dry, and you get very poor images, consequently very poor data. Uh, with tomography, you're not dependent on reflections. You've got rotating shine flug images or uh, laser scans, and you can get cross-sectional views that aren't dependent on the axial alignment of the instrument or on reflections from the tear film. And the squirrel mapping will go even further out. We might do three millimeters on a keratometer, maybe out to on a push, uh, 10 to 12 millimeters on a topographer. You can go out easily to 12, maybe even 14 on a, a Pentacam type device. Uh, these things can go out 18, 20, even sometimes 22 millimeters, uh, which brings us out onto the sclera where we can start to really appreciate the asymmetries that are out there. So just a few take home messages. Um, we hope that you've learned a lot about different ways to troubleshoot scleral lenses. And again, we, we know that while they're an excellent tool for managing our irregular corneas, they're not without their complications. So um, knowing how to manage those will make you a more successful fitter. We know that appropriate fit assessment can really help identify the etiology of the problem, and then we can adjust it accordingly. The technological advancements coming down the pike might help with troubleshooting these problems in an easier way and streamlining fitting, just like um, Dan mentioned with some of the uh, scleral mapping devices. But we do believe that continued scleral research is really important. And this is gonna help us all practice uh, evidence-based eye care so that we can provide the best care to our scleral patients. So thank you all very much. The Scleral Lens Society is a great resource for yourselves and your patients if you have any more questions about um, how to fit sclerals or resources for your patients. And we would love to answer any questions. There's a couple of questions that have come through that I'm just gonna kinda of wanna to address to a couple of different people. Um, Pam, uh, this question came in, I think it would be good for you. Is there less midday fogging in patients with molded scleral lenses, such as an iPrint Pro, because it better lines with the scleral tericity? I would probably argue yes. I think that um, not only is it because it aligns well with the peripheral system of the sclera, but it also is going to be able to control the amount of vaults pretty well throughout. So. I would argue that, yeah, it's more likely that they would have uh, less midday fogging. But of course, I'm talking about what's under the lens. This is not the front of the lens that could also get deposited, let's say, if this patient had poor tear foam quality because of my bony and gland dysfunction. Thank you. Dan, um, this question came in. Uh, how much vault would you reduce to try to reduce the fogging? How much central vault would you try to decrease? Yeah, I don't, there's, there's really not a magic number. Each one of these eyes is a snowflake. And, you know, uh, just, 
just as we make the distinction that, that Pam so eloquently did between base curves and, and sagittal depth, it's always important to remember when we talk about clearances, the apex of your, your um, ectasia or irregularity doesn't necessarily fall in the center of the cornea. I think we've all uh, seen plenty of keratoconus patients that have paracentral cones and in the extreme case, pellucids and things like that. So the, the steepest part of the cornea is not always in the center. And if you try to get 200 microns over the steepest part, you may end up really too steep everywhere else. So there, there are things where you have to really play the game and, and try to um, be cognizant of where that apex of the cornea is. And you may have to get, I was looking at one today where I had maybe about 40 to 50 microns of clearance, which is getting, you know, most people would tell you when you get to 20 or 30 microns, that's about all we can resolve clinically with any kind of fluorescein staining. Um, OCTs, maybe 10 microns. Um, so you may have to go a lot shallower at the apex in order to make sure that you're not standing off too much in the surrounding areas. So there's really no magic number. Um, and in the limbal clearances, uh, as long as you're seeing that fluorescein diffusing out, you generally have enough clearance in the limbus that you're okay. If, you, if you're fortunate enough to have an OCT, um, it's a great um, uh, safety net for you to kind of check it. And then you always have to consider the settling times. Uh, five, this is not a soft lens. Uh, throwing it on five minutes and you're done is not the thing. You know, the longer you can let these things settle, the better you'll get a more accurate picture. Uh, Dan, in, in that scenario where you're talking about decreasing that clearance, if the, uh, the question came in, is it okay to have a little bit of limbal touch as long as it's not 360? Yeah, really good question. I, I've heard a lot of our, our uh, colleagues um, debating these things through the years, and uh, at GSLS the last couple of years, there's a lot more focus on what's going on in the limbus. Uh, what There's a couple things you, you can look for again. Uh, it's important that when they come back for their progress checks, you take the lens off and you stain the cornea. Um, it's also the best way to see whether you've got any edema out there. And if any of you go back far enough with uh, uh, PMMA lenses like me, uh, sclerotic scatter is useful to see that, that central corneal clouding, but you can adjust your light source around the limbus to see if it's uh, clouding at the limbus as well. It, you can develop epithelial or microcystic changes too. Uh, you can have staining that's occurring there. Those are all signs that you're putting too much pressure on the uh, limbal areas. You shouldn't have any of that if you've got proper clearance. Most people feel that the limbal stem cells are so deep in the palisades that that kind of pressure, unless it's really excessive, probably doesn't increase the likelihood of limbal stem cell deficiency. But, um, you know, best not to trot on that area too heavily. And so the staining and doing these things after the lens is removed is really critical for picking those things up early. Perfect, thank you, Dan. Uh, Pam, this question is for you. Uh, you had a couple of cases there where the patient was uh, asymptomatic and they were doing quite well, and you had some issues where you had to refit them. Can you give us some insight into how you educate these patients on the reason for refit and possible like costs associated when they don't have any issues? Yeah, you know, I, I always kind of approach my fittings with my patients, and I and I tell them, you know, I have certain criteria for what I feel comfortable with. Of course, I want to make sure that they're seeing well, that they're comfortable. Um, but if there's any ocular insult, then I usually tell them I'm, I'm worried about long-term consequences, even though they're not symptomatic at the moment. And I feel that, you know, just having a candid conversation about this often ends very well. They're usually wanting to, you know, do what do what you recommend, and they don't want to do anything that could risk them not being able to wear these in the future. So I usually find that that's probably the, the most effective way to talk to the patients about it. And very often you won't get very much pushback from it, I believe. Thank you. Uh, Dan, this question is about Hydropeg. How long does that coating typically last or can it peel off or craze? Yeah, good question. Uh, when you listen to the, the chemist from uh, Tangible Sciences that, that created this product, 
um, they will tell you, and on their website, it will tell you it's basically designed to last the lifetime of the lens. Uh, the things that will destroy that coating are just those things I mentioned. Um, you know, enzymatic cleaners, chlorine-based cleaners like Progen, um, strong alcohol-based cleaners. You know, you don't want to use Boston Lab Cleaner on this. And actually, tap water. And really, you know, I never recommend tap water rinses to the to uh, patients with their their lenses. That kind of went out um, probably 20 years ago. But um, there are, you know, there was a survey done by some of our colleagues uh, called the Scope Study. And there's a surprising number of people that still, um, maybe 25%, 30%, I forget the exact numbers, that are still uh, allowing patients to use tap water uh, rinses. This was a survey of, of practitioners, not patients. So, you know, tap water, there's nothing good we can say about it. We know the risk of acanthamoeba. You're, you're treading on thin ice when you do those kind of things. Um, so if, you, if you'll avoid those kind of things in, a, in abrasive cleaners, um, the coating should last as long as the lens lasts. Now, there's always controversy about how often should you replace the lenses? What's the normal life expectancy of these products? Well, there, there really is no conclusive data on that. It's so user dependent on how hard they are with their lenses and, and how aggressively they clean them and, and things like that. Um, you know, if they're careful with the lenses, I usually will tell my patients, since we're dealing with largely high DK materials or hyper DK, uh, that I, I recommend replacing um, every year. Um, in some places overseas, um, even for gas perm wearers, they have subscription services where they, they've even advocated replacing every six months. Uh, we're not there in this country, but um, I think probably a year kind of corresponds to when their medically necessary benefits renew. The harder problem is how do you replace them and get them covered short of that period? And the answer is it's generally out of pocket. Thank you so much. Uh, Pam, I just had a question that came in. With what is the difference between an iPrint Pro and a regular scleral lens? Right. So um, a regular scleral lens is basically one that is lathe made by a manufacturer. The iPrint Pro is unique in that it uses a molding impression, molding technology. So for lack of a better analogy, it's almost like when you go to the dentist and get a dental mold. Um, they use um, a mold that is put directly on the eye and then the lens is fabricated from that. So it is a more uh, exact match to the ocular surface. Um, that's not to say that you can't achieve a good fit with a normal scleral, we've, we've already um, established that. But I think uh, the iPrint Pro can be particularly useful in um, really challenging cases, but it, it's one of these things that, you know, if you use it on every patient, um, it would be a much more um, mirror image of their, their eyes rather than, um, you know, having to go through the fitting process where we're, we're trying on diagnostic lenses. So um, there is a difference, but they can both achieve really good outcomes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I just going to have. Uh, I'll just address kind of one more question. This is just more about uh, management of scleral lens patients. I, if you can uh, take it for me, Dan, that would be awesome. Um, how many wear? How many hours can a lens be worn for a patient with keratoconus? And if they are to have a corneal transplant, how long after can you fit them in a lens? Um, that one's for me, Justine. That's for you. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, you know, again, it depends on the patient, but uh, they should be able to get, you know, if everything's uh, otherwise healthy with the eye, a good 12 hours or more. Um, you know, I think if you're pushing 14, 16 hours, that's an exception in my experience. Uh, but 10, 12 hours should be uh, pretty normal for the for the average cone. Um, in terms of when we typically see graft replacements. Uh, coming in for or graphs coming in for scleral lens rehabilitation. Uh, usually we're going to pick those up around three months or so. Um, sometimes you have sutures you have to work around and that sort of thing because they'll frequently leave those in for 12 months or more. Um, you know, but uh, um, you know, it can complicate sometimes getting over that corneal knee. That's where those reverse geometry lenses. Uh, help but roughly I think most of ours we see it around six months or three months excuse me 
Perfect. Yeah, I always leave it up to the discretion of the surgeon to usually being in communication with them will help kind of decide when the best time for the patient to be refit is. Perfect. I, I'm going to take just one more question because uh, we're just getting to, to that time and we want to make sure everybody's time is respected. Um, this question, let me just take the look here. Uh, Pam, when you are fitting a scleral lens, doing a trial lens fitting, do trapped bubbles affect the central vault values or is it a bad thing if it's not central or blocking the vision? So typically if the bubble is large enough that it's impacting the patient's comfort or the vision, um, you're going to want to take that out and put it back on. It's really going to impact your ability to assess the lens appropriately. Um, and usually the patient is relatively uncomfortable during that, so you want to have them have a good experience and allow yourself to uh, be able to evaluate the lens appropriately. Now, every now and again, you might get like really small peripheral mobile bubbles, which might not really be an issue, and you could probably still get through your assessment in that case because it's not large enough to actually press up against the cornea and it's not impacting the central vision. Um, and, you know, I, I, I try to, to fit without having any bubbles in there, but if it was a particularly difficult application process and the patient's having a hard time, you may decide just to assess it that way um, without removing and re reapplying the lens. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So this has been a really great talk, uh, such great knowledge from both Pam and Dan, and we appreciate everybody for attending our conference tonight.